morning is taken from 599, number 4 in your handbook, 599, and on the screen also for us, hopefully, I think.
since I have been redeemed, verses 1 through 4. Father, we see 
what the missionaries see, except we only get a small portion of it. We realize that in that country that there are, are many girls, just like the one that we saw on the screen. We pray, Lord, that they also will be able to receive the message and to accept the Savior that you are to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you can tell, Joe and Lisa are not with us today. They're over in Seattle getting ready for their annual uh, appointments, their checkups. And so I'm going to fill in for Joe. This is the time when we have our offering, when we give back to God, part of what he's blessed our lives with. And so I'd like to ask our ushers if they would come forward this time.
we would love to hear from you at this time. We'll have Ida Lee circulate the mic. Well, I would like to prepare for myself on my eyes. Also for my son Burr, he goes in Wednesday for a deal they're going to shove down his throat and try to expand his esophagus and hope and pray that it works. If not, he'll have to have surgery again. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'd like continued prayer for our granddaughter, Megan. Um, they took her off all of her medication and they're putting her back on one by one and her normal doctors were pretty shocked that the hospital did this. And they have her on a time-release type of medication and it's not kicking in real fast. So it's a real madhouse. So pray that the meds will start working soon and pray for peace for the family and guidance. Okay. Megan. Megan, right. Thank you. Okay. I'm on it, I No. <laughs> uh, prayer for Mark. He sees a urologist this week. His pain is back in his groin area, and we're just hoping that this doctor can find out what's wrong and fix it. Okay. I have a friend here from Seattle. They don't give me a They don't eat. As I have said, I, I came over from Seattle this week and I've been with uh, a good friend of everyone's here, uh, Edie Smith, and uh, she hasn't been here for a while. She hasn't gone anywhere for a while. She's been pretty immobile, uh, but she had knee surgery. Last week. Let's see. Last Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. And uh, uh, she's doing fine and everything's okay, uh, but I thought it would be good uh, for all of us to Say a little prayer for her and wish her well. Okay. He told me she's at the Regency Center. At the yeah. park. Regency. Anyone else? <laughs> All right. Let's go to prayer then. Father God, we thank you for your love. And Father, we thank you that as believers we can support and encourage one another. Father, we thank you for the many prayer requests that we have seen over the years that have been answered as we prayed. But Father, we would continue to pray for Ivy Lee and her continued healing. Father, we pray for her son, Vern, that as he goes through this, uh, pro, uh, pro, this, um, strict, this, well, his esophagus, Father, as they try to stretch the esophagus with this procedure, that uh, it will go well and that it will work and that he will not need to have uh, the surgery done. Father, we pray for Megan. Father, we know at her young age, it's so hard to go through these trials, but Father, we pray that uh, the medications that the doctors uh, put back on will work, and uh, she will be stabilized, and Father, be able to be with us for her family, be back in school, and uh, greatly encouraged. We just pray, not only for Megan, we pray for her parents as well, be with them. Father, we pray for Mark as he goes in and gets more tests. We pray for the pain that he continues to have, that they'll be able to diagnose what is going on and, and help him through this, Father. And then for Edie, uh, we just pray for her. We thank you that she's had the surgery. We just pray, Father, that uh, she'll have uh, rapid recovery so that she can be back up on her feet and uh, uh, back out and with public and with people again. Father, I'm sure there's many other requests that uh, are represented here today. We just put them all into your hands, Father. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. All right, I'm going to switch gears here. This that mean Joe here. All right, if you have your Bibles, please turn them to 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. As many of you know, we've been going through the Gospel of John now for a period of time, and uh, we have found out that love is one of the themes of the Gospel of John. This morning we're going to be talking about love of one another. My dad, when I was growing up, used to like to tell stories. He was from Missouri, and of course uh, he was from the Show Me State, you know, you got to show him. But anyway, one of the stories that he told several times when I was growing up, uh, I thought about as uh, I was preparing for this message. Uh, there were two men, Jim and, and Bob. And when Jim and Bob were, were growing up, uh, they went swimming one day, and Bob got out into the lake and realized he couldn't swim and was drowning. So Jim jumped in and saved his life. Well, as the years went by, many years went by, they went different ways, and Bob became a wealthy businessman. And Jim 
fell on hard times. Well, one day he was going down the street, and there was Bob. And he, Jim walked up to Bob and he said, Bob, it's so good to see you. Look, at, I hate to ask it. You know, I'm really in need right now. Could you lend me a little bit of money? Bob looked at him and said, why should I lend you money? And Jim said, when we were boys, I saved your life. And Bob said, yeah, but what have you done for me lately? <laughs> it, it, as funny as that attitude seems, that's almost an attitude sometimes that you and I as believers have, not only to the Lord, but especially to fellow believers. It, it, it's hard for us sometimes to reach out and do things and share love like we ought to. Well, as we get into our key verse this morning, it, I believe, is one of the key, key verses of the whole letter of 1 John. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, John writes this, This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The point that we want to make simply as we go through this this morning is this. God loved us even when we were unlovely. When we were his enemies. When we were apart from him. When we had turned our backs on him. God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die for our sins. That's the sort of love that we should have. And so the question that I need to ask myself as I go through a passage of scripture like this is... Do I love others the way that God loves me? Pretty important test. All right, three things this morning as we go through this. God is love. God showed his love. And God completes his love. Most of us think about the first two, that God is love and he showed his love. But did you know that you and I have a part in the love of God? All right? First of all, God is love. Now, for many of us as believers, that seems like a no-brainer. We've been around church our whole lives. But do we really know what that means when we say God is love? Well, if we go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, it's interesting, if you read the King James Version, uh, in this verse it says, Beloved. In the NIV Version, it says, Dear Friends. Well, in the original Greek language that John wrote this in, he used a very unique phraseology so that you could literally translate this as, Those who are loved, let us love. So in other words, he's not just saying, Dear Friends, or Beloved, let us love one another. Those who are loved. In other words, we've experienced the love of God because we have experienced the love of God. Let us love. Now, John, according to Guzik, insists that there is something that is given to the believer when they are born of God. A love is imparted to their life that they did not have before. In other words, you know the story. Jesus goes to Nicodemus. And he tell, uh, Nicodemus goes to Jesus. Nicodemus asks, what do I need to do? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And, you know, we have this concept. What does it mean to be born again? Well, when we become a believer in Christ, when we commit our lives to him, we are literally born again. And as we are born again, things change when the Holy Spirit comes into our life. And one of the things that changes is that we have a new sort of love in our life. You know, you can turn on the radio and listen to all these songs about love. You can turn on the Hallmark Channel. My wife was watching a brand new movie last night. She'd never seen it before. And I was not supposed to interrupt her because she was into this movie. And of course, it was a love story. You know, we know that people in the world are capable of love. But when we come to know Christ, we now have agape love. God's love in our heart like we have never known it before. Now, John says everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. How do we know that we know? Well, the specific word for knows here is the Greek word gnosko. It is the word for a knowledge by experience. In other words, 
the Greek language is far more explicit than English is at times. We have a word knowledge. They had several words for knowledge. There was theoretical knowledge, there was knowledge you read, but knowing something by experience, living it out was the word that is used here. So that everyone who expresses the same sort of love, that agape love that God has for us, knows that they know God because of what God is doing in their life. Now, 1 John 4, 8. Whoever does, not, uh, know God, uh, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, again, we're talking about agape love, God's love. Marshall says, it is because men are created in the image of God, an image that has been defaced but not destroyed by the fall, that they have the capacity to love. Human love, however, noble and however highly motivated, falls short if it refuses to include the Father and Son as the supreme objects of its affection. So, if we do not love as God loves, if we do not have agape love in our life, then we don't know Him. Because God is love. God is agape. That's, this is a glorious truth. Love describes the character and heart of God. He is so rich in love and compassion that it can be used to describe his very being. So think of it this way. Let's say you're asked to describe God. And you come up with a long list of these big theological words. He's omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. He's omniscient, he knows everything. And you come up with all these big words. And someone says, well, can't you just describe him in one word? The one word, according to John, that would describe God, the very essence of his character, is what? Love. Charles Spurgeon said this, Never let it be thought that any sinner is beyond the reach of divine mercy so long as he is in the land of the living. I stand here to preach illimitable love, unbounded grace to the vilest of the vile. So the type of love that God has for us, the type of love that He is, goes beyond who we are. It doesn't matter how good we are, it doesn't matter how bad we are, we cannot earn God's love. God is love, and God gives us His love. So that's the first thought that John is sharing, God is love. But then let's move on to a second thought. God showed His love. How did He do that? How did God prove to us as mankind you and I, that he truly is love. Well, in 1 John 4, 9, it says this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This shows us what love is and what it means. Love is not only defined by the sacrifice of Jesus, it is also defined by the giving of the Father. So it's not like God was up there in heaven, he looked down at humanity and said, I love you. God showed us his love by giving his one and only Son. Which leads us to our key verse, which is in verse 10. Remember what it said? This is love. So what is love? Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. While you and I were still sinners, while you and I were in the state of rebellion against him, when we were going our way, doing our own thing, when we were not expressing any love whatsoever, that is when God demonstrated his love by sending Jesus. You know, religion is mankind's attempt to try to work its way back to God. You know, well, if I'm only good enough, if I only do these good deeds, or if I do that, maybe God will love me. But that's not the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is not man looking for God, but God looking for man. In fact, remember the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve sinned. God shows up, and they hide themselves. And the first thing he does is he goes looking for them. And the rest of the story of the Bible is not us going to God, but God coming for us. 
That is what love is. It, the love of the Father was not only in sending of the Son, but also in what that sending accomplishes for us. It brings life to all who trust in Jesus and His work on their behalf, because He is the propitiation for our sins. The word in the, in the uh, NIV version is the atoning sacrifice. Propitiation is one of those big $10 words you learn in seminary and never use during the rest of the week. <laughs> But it means that God sacrificed Jesus for us. Now, I found this absolutely phenomenal quote by Boyce. Listen to what he said. If God had merely sent Jesus to teach us about himself, that would have been wonderful enough. It would have been fair more than we deserved. If God had sent Jesus simply to be our example, that would have been good too and would have been of some value. But the wonderful thing is that God did not stop with these, but rather sent His Son, not merely to teach or be our example, but to die the death of a felon that He might save us from sin. You know, when you talk to people, if you walk down the street and you ask somebody, do you, do you believe in Jesus? They might say, oh yes. Yep, He was the best man who ever lived. Oh yes, Jesus was a really good teacher. Yep, Jesus was our moral example. Well, those are all good things. But God's love was not demonstrated by making Jesus an example. God's love was demonstrated by making Jesus a sacrifice. That he died and shed his blood. He was our atoning sacrifice. That's how we know. This shows the love of God. God gave his son to die and to die for sinners. We can think of someone paying a great price to save someone deserving, someone good, someone noble, someone who had done much for them. But God did all this for rebels, for sinners, for those who had turned their backs on Him. So, it's one thing to say God is love. It's another thing to say that God loves us. But we know that God loves us because He sent Jesus to die for our sins. But now let's go to the third thought. Not only God is love, not only did God show His love, but God completes His love. How can you and I be involved in this? Verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. So, we say we're believers. We say we've invited Jesus Christ to be our personal Savior and Lord. We say that we know uh, forgiveness of sins. If that's the case, we've experienced God's love. And if we've experienced God's love in our life, then we ought to be able to turn around and experience it and express it to others. Now, that can be easy if somebody's your friend. Or maybe if somebody's done really something good for you, you want to do something good for them. But what about someone you do not like? What about someone you don't enjoy even being around? What about someone who's been mean to you, or maybe even your enemy? Are you able to express love to them? Remember what it said? Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Another fantastic quote that I found by Charles Spurgeon. Has anybody offended you? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but I'm just assuming that every one of us in this room, at some time or another, has been offended. Right? Seek reconciliation. Oh, but I am the offended party. And Lord, you don't understand. They offended me. Okay? So I don't need to do anything good for them. They're, they're the bad doer. So was God. And he went straight away and sought reconciliation. Brother, do the same. Oh, but I have been insulted. Now, I'm just wondering, is there anybody here in the room today who's been insulted sometime in their life? Nobody? Oh. All right. Well, in case you have been insulted sometime in your life, how do you feel about the person that has insulted you? Just so. So was God. All the wrong towards him. 
yet he sent. Oh, but the party was so unworthy. Well, guess what? So are you. But God loved you and sent his son. Go write according to that copy. So in other words, we don't have any excuses. We can't say, I don't like that person. They were mean to me. They offended me. They insulted me. I am the wounded party. I can have a pity party. Uh-uh. Because God was in that position. The human race had rejected him. And yet he loved and said to son. Some think, some people think that the greatest evidence of God's presence or work is power. A lot of people would like to see power in the church, power in their lives. Some people think the greatest evidence of God's presence or work is popularity. We'd all like to be popular, right? Some think that the greatest evidence of God's presence or work is passionate feelings. But the greatest evidence of God's presence and work is love. Where God is present and working, there will be love. We think, you know, if I could get up in front of thousands of people and heal somebody on the spot, wow, everybody would know that God is in my life. But guess what? The greatest demonstration that God is really working in your life is whether or not you love. Now, God is love, God showed his love, and God completes his love. Back in the 1970s, a man by the name of Don Richardson wrote a book. He and his wife had been missionaries in the South Pacific, in the islands, amongst some tribal peoples that were very primitive. And they went there as medical missionaries. And their goal was to help them out. And so as they set themselves up in this tribe, they you know, dispensed medicine, things were going well, except amongst the tribes, they were fighting with one another. Not only were they fighting and killing one another, but they found out that the people they were working with, the highest virtue was not love. The highest virtue was treachery. It could you somehow trick your adversary into coming in and then killing them. That was virtuous. Well, finally, they had had enough. Finally, they went to the chief of the village where they were at and said, we're leaving. And he said, I don't want you to leave. We want your medicine. They said, we can't stay here with all this killing going on. Unless you make peace with the neighboring tribe, we will leave. Is there any way that you could do that? The chief thought for a while and finally said, a peace child. And Don Richardson asked him, well, what is a peace child? The chief said, if someone from our village and our tribe gives a child to the neighboring tribe, our enemies, and they raise that child, as long as that child is alive, there will be peace. There will be no fighting between our two tribes. So Don Richardson, do you have such a child? The chief thought, he said, I have a son. I have a baby. He is my only son. And so they had a big ceremony. And these two tribes that hated one another got together. And here this chief of the tribe where the Richardsons were living took this baby, which was his son, his only son. And he gave it and placed it in the hands of the chief of the tribe that were their mortal enemies. That chief received that baby and they made a pact that as long as that peace child was alive, there would be peace between these two tribes. Afterwards, Don Richardson took this chief aside and said, do you know what you did? You did what God did. We as humans were his enemies. But God took his son, his only son, and gave his son that we could have peace with God. That chief became a believer. Many in that village became believers. Many in that tribe became believers because they understood that Jesus was their peace child. They had given one of their own 
to their enemies so that there could be peace. Remember our key verse this morning? 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The point is this. God loved us, and even while we were unlovely, God loved the unlovely. You and I are the unlovely. The question is, do I love others the way that God loves me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this passage of Scripture today. And Father, as we go through it, if there's somebody who is sitting there thinking, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I don't know if I've ever personally come to know Jesus and if I've experienced God's love. What better time than right now during this quiet time, for them to just simply pray to you and ask Jesus to be their Savior and Lord. But Father, for those of us as believers, we pray that each and every one of us would experience the love of God in such a real way that then we will want to turn to those around us and share God's love with them the way we've received God's love. Be with us, encourage our hearts, for it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. All right, we have a closing hymn for you. Yes, stand, please. And Tex, would you be willing to take the microphone and pronounce the benediction for us?